Okay, so here's the roadmap for what we're doing today. The idea is we're really going to talk about creating the building envelope. And in service of that, we're going to go through just kind of a, a very similar steps to what we did last time. We're going to talk about walls. We're going to talk about doors and windows and finally curtain walls. We're going to go marching through all those different things. But we're going to do it with a lot more nuance. We're going to do it with a lot more sort of uh, kind of really focusing on the options and the features that are available to you so you can really do it kind of uh, just with more control. So in terms of thinking about the building envelope, at a high level, there's some things we need to sort of uh, you know, include when we're talking about the building envelope. For the envelope, we're typically talking about the exterior walls, the windows, the doors, the openings in there. So you know, just the, the part that we're sort of seeing here, not so much the interior. We often think about the roof. Okay? And as part of all this, it can include things like curtain wall elements, columns, just sort of a lot of the elements that are in here. So the building element, it, it typically includes, when I talk about the envelope, these sorts of elements, as opposed to all the interior elements. In terms of what we're trying to do with that, there's really, from a design standpoint, a lot of things we want to try to accomplish. If we're worried about the architectural side, aesthetically, we sort of play games with this whole notion of really, oh, you know, the materials, the forms, the balance between the solids and the skeletals. There's some things we're trying to achieve architecturally to create a good looking building and one that performs very well. Okay, so we need to think about some of these issues, like how the materials um, are going to affect the appearance as well as affect the sustainability and the performance of the overall building. Okay? Functionally, we need to think about really the envelope supporting loads. Very often we use the building envelope to support the roof loads and bring them on down. So if we're going to have huge expanses of glass, we need to sort of think about some sort of structural support that will carry those loads as opposed to the glass trying to carry those loads, as opposed to solid walls like this, which can often have the structural support just built right into them, carrying those on down. Yeah. Another function we try to do is just really the envelope's all about separating the interior from the exterior. So we think about that not in, ter in terms of its sort of thermal performance, you know, how much heat is able to radiate throughout those, those materials or kind of come on in through those materials, as well as just the lighting that's provided through the windows and how much daylighting gets into the center, as well as even like this uh, uh, image sort of illustrates some little shading features. Can we do things on the envelope to sort of not capture the daylight, but also shield out some of the sunlight? Because we want one, but not necessarily the other all the time. Okay, so the envelope really gives you a very, very rich kind of uh, you know, place to play around with and think about like how you design your building. Most of the times people, you know, a lot of efforts put on the building envelope because it's such an important component of what's going on. So uh, you know, that's why we sort of start right there. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to approach this. And that is we're going to start by just looking at the issue of walls. And within walls, we're going to be looking at just how uh, the instance properties for walls, we're going to look at for some specific walls, how we can go through and like uh, set the tops, the bottoms, the heights, things like that. We're going to look at the type properties, which is all about the layering and the structures and the materials in the walls. We look at a type of wall called a stacked wall, where we have two different wall types on top of each other, and think about how we can sort of customize the size and shapes. So let's start out with the whole issue of the instance properties. And to look at this, let's actually go ahead and flip back over to Revit. So if you're looking at Revit on your screen, let's go ahead and just go through and create some walls. If you want to, you can get rid of my little building over here. That was my little example building. So say goodbye to it. We don't need it. Let's go ahead and put a new wall in there. And as we put a wall, let's kind of take a look at some of these different properties. There's this notion when we place the wall right away of really what the height is going to be, whether it's unconnected and going up to 20 feet or whether we're going to attach it to another level. And when we do that, what we're doing is we're actually setting a property called the top constraint of the wall. And I'll just set that to roof for right now. We'll take a look at where that shows up again in just a moment. There's the type of the wall up here, and there's a property over here. This is an instance property called the location line. And the location line is all about, as we draw a wall, where that wall actually is going to get located relative to what we sketch. So let me zoom in a little bit so we can really sort of get a sense. If I draw a wall on center lines, you see that little blue line that's coming through? That's the center of the wall, not the center of the core. That's the center of the entire wall structure. Okay, and that wall is being drawn on its center line. Okay, let's change it to a different type. We'll go to wall, and I'll say let's do it by its, let's say, the finish face exterior. And when I draw that, 
you'll see that as I'm drawing, the blue is at the outside. Again, let's try one more variation on it. Let me even zoom in a little bit closer. And we'll draw a wall. And we'll go ahead and say the finished face of the interior. And what's happening here is as I draw, I have the interior of the wall instead. Now, this whole notion of where the wall lands relative to its location line is really mostly about when you first draw it. Oh, it does sort of have an effect also in terms of flipping the wall. Let me go ahead and actually what I should have done is let me do this. I'll set up something called a reference plane so you can sort of see what the effect is. Where, oh, where did it go? I see your levels. Everything always hides from me. Okay. Reference plane is really just a piece of, a, what is it? It's a piece of reference geometry. I'm going to go through and again put one of these uh, at the center line. So I'll draw it right on top of this. That reference plane is just going to give me sort of a point of reference to uh, understand what's happening as I change these different types. Let me draw another one. We'll do it at the uh, area exterior. Okay, and then finally we'll do one of those <laughs> for the interior. Yes. Okay, it's actually hiding from you a little bit. It is over, it's way over on the right hand side. There's this thing called, it's, yours probably looks a little bit better. Setting the work planes, showing the work plane, and reference plane is right underneath it. See if you can find it over there. My screen's a little truncated, so I have trouble seeing those things, and it always makes it a little distracting as we're trying to do it. The reference plane is really just, it's a, it's, it's really, what is it? It's a, it's a reference line. <laughs> it's self-referential. Um, it's just an artificial construction line that's really just there to help you hang and align different pieces of the geometry. It has no real meaning, okay, but you can align things to it. And then if we move the reference line, um, those things will move with it. So it's just like a construction line. Okay. okay. Now we've placed these different walls relative to the reference line. There's uh, this location line property. Let's go ahead and take a look at these walls and sort of see uh, what sort of happens now. So this one was placed in the center. Since it's in the center, if I choose a flip, okay, it actually stays in the center. Although we've gone ahead and flipped the inside and the outside, it flips about the location line. Is really kind of what my point's going to be. Over here, if I choose this wall and I choose to flip it, see it flips over because your wall will flip around its location line. Let's go ahead and flip this wall. Same sort of thing. It'll flip around the location line. Now, that may be sort of a very esoteric like uh, thing for right now. Ultimately, it doesn't matter a whole lot as you go through and draw things. It's really more sort of a matter of convenience. But be aware that if you do put walls and you need to flip the orientation inside and out, that's where it's going to be or going around. So uh, yeah, it's typically better to go ahead and uh, place things oh, by the core or by the exterior as opposed to the wall center lines. But you, know, you just don't need to understand what's controlling as you're going through and doing those things. Let's try something else. Let me try this one. This is a wall center line. Let's try changing to a wall of a very different type. For example, I will change that to a oh, brick on metal studs, which is a much fatter wall. And notice what happens. Even though I've changed to a new wall type, the new wall type that's much thicker is still <coughs> centered on that, because that's a wall center line wall. Whereas this one over here, which is based on the exterior face, if I change that, it's going to grow from that exterior face out. So the wall you know, location line, it does have some important properties, but it's really more has to do with sort of when you change wall types or you flip, what's going to happen to the geometry that you've drawn relative to that line. Okay, Let's take a look at a couple of properties of the wall you need to know about. I'll pop into 3D just so you can sort of see all these different walls. Oh, I still got my roof hanging around. It's not very good. All of these walls are currently set. They have type properties to them. And you can, oh, excuse me, instance properties. We can open them and sort of let me push this off to the side so you can sort of see. There's this notion of, OK, there's the location line. That's wall center line, or inside or outside face, or the face of the core. There's the base constraint currently set to level 1. There's the top constraint set to the roof level, set to the roof level. And we can go through and change these. 
We can change the constraints from level one to level two if we had it to a different roof level. We don't have a whole lot of levels to work with in this one, but we can go ahead and change and stretch a walls top and bottom to a different constraint. We could also change offsets relative to that. And let me show you what that looks like. If we change a wall and we add an offset, level one, and let's offset it three feet from level one, when we say OK, it'll pop up. Maybe it's best to actually look at that in an elevation view. You'll see that a little bit better. What am I looking at? I'm probably looking at the south elevation. So probably the north elevation. <laughs> but that one over there, if I look at the instance properties, I can change it to another level, for example, five feet. And what it's going to do is give me something that is this surface at the bottom is five feet off of the level line. Okay. You can also put in negative offsets. Let's change that. Let's put in there that it wants to go down negative five feet. Popping on down. Now oh, it's actually sort of buried alive in the dirt right now, so you're not seeing it very well. It's kind of going down in there. We could also do the offsets from the top. So for example, again, for the instance properties, if I want it to be the level roof but actually go up three feet taller, I can do that. So let's kind of think about where this is useful, because actually it is. You don't necessarily want to create new levels for every different sort of horizontal line in your building. Where we tend to use this is, for example, if you have a roof level but you have a parapet wall that's sort of extending above the roof level, you can put an offset that says the roof is actually going to be at this level, but the parapet's going to extend up another three feet beyond that roof level. And when the nice thing is, if that is set as the offset of three feet to that, same sort of thing over here, if we change that to 12 feet, okay, it'll stay three feet above it. Okay, so whenever we have a relationship where you want to be based on a level, but you want to put just a little bit of an offset and code that in there, you know, these, the offset constraints are very good. Other places this is very good. I use these for things like garden walls or like little seating walls where I want a wall that it goes to level, let me do it this way. Let's choose this one. I'll say that I want this to be from level one and the top of it wants to be level one plus two foot six. I now have a little wall that's always going to be hanging on level one, but it's going to be two foot six tall relative to level one. Okay, so I don't know. It's just different ways of working with it. Another place we tend to use this is if you ever have a soffit wall, um, a wall that's kind of above like some sort of portal where the wall actually starts at like seven feet and just goes up to the ceiling or something like that. And how you would do something like that is, let me do it to this one over here. Let me choose that one. I can say, let's change its instance properties. So it'll start at level one at seven feet and then go to the roof. Okay, and what it'll do, it'll leave a big gap at the bottom of the wall. Okay, so it's just depending upon your design condition, what you're trying to do, these top and level off, they're really handy in terms of doing that. But whenever you can, go ahead and instead of sort of manually putting in an explicit sort of dimension that's going to be eight feet off the ground. If you can make it all relative to roof levels or floor levels, yeah. Another way we could have done this is I could say, same sort of relationship, I could say the bottom of that wall is that it's um, seven feet above level one. Another way to do it would be, say, lo roof level like <laughs> minus three. That would be another way to sort of create a soffit wall. It just sort of depends. One would basically always be related to how high it is off the floor level. The other one's going to always be related to how low it should be relative to the roof level. So just different variations on a theme. Okay, so a lot of control in terms of what's going on there. So be using location line, the base, and the top constraints in terms of just controlling the height of your walls. Okay. Now we'll be able to override that. We'll see in a little bit by changing the profile or attaching the tops of walls, but that's where it starts. Okay, let me give you one other sort of variation about walls that you need to know, or kind of important thing about walls as you draw them. Let's do this. As you draw walls, there's this whole wall notion that walls have insides and outsides. Okay, and they have an inside face and an outside face. So let's explain how that works. This is again one of those things that sounds really weird, but it will make more sense after you sort of play with it a little bit. If I choose this, uh, some sort of wall, let me do one that where it's pretty clear about what the inside and the outside is. We'll do this one that has the brick on the outside so you really see it as we're drawing it. Okay. As you, if you draw your walls, if you draw them clockwise, okay, the outside will always be to the, ex you know, the exterior face will be on the outside of what you draw. 
if you draw them counterclockwise, the exterior face will be on the inside of what you draw. Now, it sounds really weird, but once you see it, it'll make more sense. Okay, so if I'm drawing a wall and I'm moving along out here, let me zoom on in so you can sort of see it a little bit better. And now I'm coming down here and I'm coming over here. Do you understand that as being draw as drawing clockwise? Okay, even if I go down here for just a little bit and keep going this way, I still, I started going clockwise, so it understands it's doing that. Now, it's still okay, you could always go back and flip a wall in case it's wrong. Okay. But if you draw things in a clockwise fashion, you'll tend to always get the behavior you want, or you'll more likely get that. And let's sort of uh, just contrast that to counterclockwise. If I draw this way, Basically, the outside's on the inside. Okay, again, if that happens to you, and that happens to us all, because as we go placing walls, if we don't pay attention, it just sort of happens. You could always flip them. Let me try this. That one is currently set to, I, I want to see if I can sort of fix this. Here I am, I'm doing a flip that wall. Great, but the wall moved. That may not be what we want to have happen. So let's see if we can fix that. If I choose that wall and I say that, hey, currently the location line is defined as the exterior, if I change it to the center line, okay, and then flip it, yeah, the wall will stay in place. So that's sort of a way you can use the wall center lines. If you don't want your walls moving around when you flip them, change them over to center line walls, and then the, uh, the flip will be relative to the center as opposed to the inside or outside face. Okay, but don't worry about that too much. You're gonna sort of, you'll, You'll learn that by kind of st struggling with it a little bit, making the mistake a couple times, and having to flip your walls around. But be aware that walls have insides and outsides. Okay, next up, we want to look at the issue of the type properties of a wall. And for the type properties, this is the whole idea of really kind of what are the materials that the wall is made out of, just really all the layering and what we can do with that. So let's go ahead and take a look at these walls and see if we can like, uh, make some sense of them. For a wall, any wall at all, you can go ahead and choose it. For example, this is my exterior EIFS on metal stud wall. Or this wall over here is my wood siding on two by six stud. There's these types defined. Okay, and these types are predefined wall assemblies, different structures, materials, thicknesses that are all adding up. And that's kind of cool. We have these ones that are already defined for us, but chances are, as you go working, you'll want something else that's not in that list. Okay? And here's how you can go ahead and explore and change that. So choose one of the types, one of the walls of any of the types, and say type properties. And what happens is we see the type name. Now, there's not too much else going on in here. We can start getting into putting in a cost for the wall, a fire rating for the wall, and some information that might be more important when we uh, start thinking about how this thing is constructed. But for now, I want to look at the issue of structure. So if you click on the structure of the wall, you'll get to this dialog, which really lets us edit the individual layers and start changing things. So let's take a look at this dialog and how you read it. It starts with, there's an interior side of the wall and an exterior side of the wall. There's a bunch of different layers of the wall. In between these two things called the core boundary, that's the core of the wall. When I talked about things extending to the core, whatever's between those two lines is considered the core of the wall. And this wall has a core weight of, made of wood dimensional lumber five and a half inches thick. We have on the outside, I have wood sheathing, half inch. I have finish wood siding, one inch. I have a vapor barrier, which is zero inches. And I also have gypsum wall board in here, which is half inch. So super, that's this wall. If we want to kind of, hey, Mr. Page, if we want to kind of keep on working with a wall this way, we can. Or if we want to go through and change this wall, we can. So for example, let's try saying, OK, this is a wood siding wall on two by six studs. What if I wanted a two by four stud wall instead? Let's do something simple. What I would do is I'd say, let me just OK to this. I have this type. If I would like something which is a different type but like to keep the two by sixes around, I'd duplicate it. So I, let's say make that a two by four stud wall. Again, I'm just duplicating the name. I can edit the structure of that one. And here it looks just like the old structure because we duplicated it. I can change the dimensions, like three and a half. Okay. As I change the dimensions here, 
Okay, what happens is up here, the total thickness also changes. So the total thickness is always going to be the sum of all these individual thicknesses. Okay, so if you knew that your siding was going to be, for example, something a little bit different, if you knew that your siding was going to be three quarters of an inch thick as opposed to one inch thick, we can put that in there. And what will happen is the total thickness will change. If we know that it's going to be three inches thick, we can put that in there. And it's going to change to seven and a half. So go ahead and in this, adjust the wall assembly to really be what you're going to be building with, because you want that thickness to be accurate so all your plans sort of reflect you know, truly how this thing is going to get built. Now, this layering is actually sort of important. Each of these different layers actually has a material associated with it. And there's this notion of whether the material wraps. What that's all about is when things come to a corner, okay, things that can wrap will wrap around the corner and uh, merge with each other. So for example, the gypsum wallboard, when we come to a corner, it'll actually merge into like one surface that goes around the corner. Okay? Same thing with the siding. It's going to wrap around the outside. So it's really just about the joining conditions at corners and intersections. Generally, things like to wrap. So I would, you know, you know, unless you have a specific need, tend to keep things turned on with wrapping. Okay? But let's go ahead and say, oh, well, that's an interesting wall, but that's not the one I really want. We'll say, OK, that. Let's create something very different. Let's go ahead and create some sort of wall which is kind of like the Y2E2 walls, which are sort of, you know, if you didn't watch, you'll see them being built on Ginson when they do that. It's kind of like a metal stud structure, then there's like some foam, then there's some stone panels on the top of it. There's a whole system to it. And how you would go through and create that looks like this. You go down and you're in this list, see if you could find something that sort of seems about right. Oh, I think the EIFS system on metal studs might be a close one. And I'll duplicate that. And I'm going to change that to say, say, stone panels on metal stud. Again, this is just a convenience name for you to find it. The nice thing is, by creating these new types, if the wall assembly is defined one way today and partway through the whole design process, we decide it needs to change and its thickness will change, no problem. We're just going to change the type and the whole structure will update to kind of adopt those new characteristics. So we'll say edit the structure. And here we can start playing around with it. The metal stud layer is probably about the same, and it probably still has the gypsum wall bird on the inside. Let's say that for this wall, oh, we probably don't need the wood sheathing. Let me take that out. To take that out, I would choose it and just delete it. Give me a little air gap layer of two inches. I'll leave that in there. But up here, I'm going to change that. There's this EIFS. Oh, is it, is it expanding insulating foam system? OK, exterior insulated foam system. A very common way we build like stucco buildings now. It's kind of cheap and very well insulated. There's a lot of good things about that. If we wanted to change to a different sort of material, for example, a stone panel, what we can do is okay, we'll set the thickness. So whatever the thickness of those stone veneer panels will be, maybe two inches. Then we'll go through and choose the material. And to choose the material, get on into that field and click right on this little control, the one that looks like the dot, dot, dot. And what it'll do is it'll take us to a materials dialog where we can go ahead and choose some different materials. Now, there's all sorts of materials defined for us here. And we'll play a lot more with this later when we start talking about rendering. But we need to sort of find a material that's close. And if we don't actually find the material we want, we can even create a new material. Each of the materials has a color. It has a surface pattern. It even has a photographic appearance for when we render it. Okay? So again, we're going to play with that a whole lot more later. But just to go ahead and get us started today, Let's see if I can find anything that looks like stone. I got, I got masonry stone. I don't know. I got stone too. Let me go ahead. I'm going to create a new material. I'm just going to say, change it, create a brand new material. How I did that is down here at the bottom of the materials list. There's something that looks like oh, several sheets of paper where you copy them. Click on that. We're creating a Revit material. I'm going to call this uh, like uh, stone veneer panels. I can now decide really, OK, for that stone veneer panel, how do I want them to look? I can choose a color for them. 
let me go ahead and just click in here. Oh, I'm going to make them uh, kind of a light tan color, something like that. That nah, doesn't look very sandstone-y, does it? Let's go ahead. That's a little better, a little yellowier. Got to have that Stanford sandstone look. Okay, we'll choose that. So they would render in this color on the exterior surface. We could also decide if we want to have a surface pattern on them. The surface pattern would be in a 3D view, should there be lines that are sort of illustrating that they're panels. Like for horizontal siding, we put like just da lines going horizontally. Let's see if I can find anything in here that I like. I'll click on this. Again, what I clicked on was uh, the little selection bar over there. Actually, I can do it here too. Uh, those are drafting patterns. I want to go to model patterns. Model, let me think of those distinctions. Drafting patterns sort of appear at a certain size when they're printed on the page. Model patterns render appropriately for the scale of the model in like 3D views. Okay, so yeah, it's kind of a funny distinction. You'll play with that more, but drafting patterns are always appropriately sized for printing. Model patterns are uh, sized appropriately, so they always look appropriate to the model scale. Okay, and let's choose a model pattern. Let's see what I can find here. Let me go for that, oh, there it is, block 8 by 16s. It's a little bit small, but we'll work with that. That's kind of similar to what we have out here in Y2E2. Okay, so I'll say OK. Now, what have we done with all this? Okay, let's say OK to all this. We've created a new wall type. It's 10 and a half inches thick. It has stone veneer on the outside. It has an understood material. It has color, a thickness. It has an appearance to it. Let's go ahead and see what that actually looks like. Say OK, OK, because we're going to use that panel type. So for example, let me go back to 3D. Let me zoom on out of here. Maybe I'll orbit a little so I can sort of see that mess that I've created. So over here, I can choose that wall. And if I now choose my. What did I call them? Stone panels on metal stud. Okay, You'll see that its type has changed. It's got a much less thick wall, and it also has that surface pattern and that color on the outside. So it's just creating different wall types. The important thing you need to know there is you, know, you can change them, you can customize them, and you should, because when we start really getting into trying to understand what this is constructed of so we can cost it out, or we can just really start planning the construction sequence, you want to have accurate wall types. You know, there's this inclination at first, you can go ahead and just sort of create everything as generic walls, and that's OK to get started with. But if you can start getting to the actual understanding of what your wall assemblies are like you know, early on, better off for you. It just really makes uh, your modeling a lot more accurate. OK, so we're pretty good on wall types. Very good. Let me switch you to a kind of slight variation on that. We often have this notion of walls where there's actually more than a single wall type that you want to sort of combine together. It's, oh, on a lot of buildings now, we have a wainscot of sort of one type of wall and another type of wall above it. Okay? And if you want to do that, that's called a stacked wall. It's really easy to set up. You just need to have two different walls, one that has one type and one that has the other type, and stack them on top of each other, specifying what the relationship is. Now, for each of these different sort of surfaces, for each of these different types, like, um, you need to specify which dimensions are going to be fixed and which ones are going to let vary. Because what's going to happen, for example, on this wall, this wall total height can vary. It needs to understand, you know, is this going to be fixed at four feet and that part will vary, or is this going to be fixed at eight feet and that part will vary? So you just have to sort of choose which is going to drive and which one's going to follow. Okay, but that's all there is to stacked walls. So let's show you what that looks like. It's really simple. Come back over to Revit. We'll choose this fabulous little stone veneer wall that we have right now. And let's look in the types. In the types, as you go from the top to the bottom, you'll find what are called basic walls. And they're kind of hanging around looking pretty good. There's the generic walls. Those are the ones you're tempted to use at first. They're just kind of very gray generic walls. But you know, they don't have much structural information. So I'm going to discourage you from using those. Instead, go for real types. There's some interior wall types. Curtain walls, which we'll get to in just a moment. And there's a stacked wall. Let's take a look at it. Stacked wall, this is the one that was illustrated in the slide. So brick over kind of a CMU wall. 
Let's go ahead and create one that actually has our stone panels over brick, or maybe our stone panels with brick above it. Doesn't really matter, just some variation on that theme. And how you do it is as follows. Choose the wall. Okay. You're going to get used to this. Whenever I want to create a new thing that's an awful lot like an existing thing, but a little bit different, I'm going to say, go to the type properties and duplicate a type. So get used to that one. I say it a lot. I'll say, duplicate this type. Let me say, oh, stack wall exterior. Let me say it's going to be brick over stone panels. No worries. We'll edit its structure. This is going to be similar, although instead of opposed to editing the layers horizontally, we're editing it ver vertically. We have these different types of walls. So any of the type of walls that you've already defined are available here. So if I want to have the brick over the stone panels, what I need to do is just change this bottom one. And I'll change that to be stone panels as opposed to the CMU. OK, but it's really just choosing two different types. Here's this issue of which one's variable. Currently, this is set so the bottom panel will always be three feet. The top will be variable. Let's change that to be a little bit different so it at least looks different. Let's make uh, five feet at the bottom. Say OK. So the nice thing is, hmm, it's not really a good match for the height, but that'll be OK. Let me stretch this wall up. Okay. It's staying five feet at the bottom. OK, so that's what's going on there. Let's try changing this around a little bit. Let's edit this, the type properties. Let's switch the orientation. What if, on the other hand, we said that the brick was the constant and the stone was going to vary? And to do that, what you need to do, it's a little inverted because you have to sort of figure out which one's going to be the variable. Choose the one that you want to be variable and then click this button. So I'll say the bottom will be variable and then the top will be five feet. Or let me make it like uh, four feet, something like that. Let's say OK. Looks very different. But because the top is the one that's fixed now and the bottom is variable, what happens is as I go popping the wall on down, okay, that four feet of brick at the top is always going to be honored. Okay, and instead, the stone's going to change instead. So you just have the control over which one you want to have variable. Now, why do we bother with stacked walls and stuff like that? Because yeah, we do do this, do this type of construction. If you look around, even on campus, you'll find a lot of buildings that have sort of one thing down at the base of the building and something a little bit different when you get above a certain height. One of the nice things about stacked walls is if you do something like put a door or a window in them, <laughs> well, didn't do such a great job of demonstrating my point. They will do a pretty good job of trying to cut intelligently into both those things. I should do something a little bit better in terms of aligning my surfaces uh, horizontally, in terms of making that look better. But the nice thing is if you put openings in a stacked wall, it'll cut through both the different sections of the stacked wall, as opposed to stacking up one wall and then trying to build another wall on top of it. Another thing that's nice about using stacked walls for is if you need this type of construction, if the wall moves, the upper wall will move with it. Another kind of real common case where we use this, and in fact, you'll use this uh, in assignment two, is if we have something where we're building on a hillside and we have sort of a concrete retaining wall with a wood frame wall above it, okay, stacked wall is a very good way to do it. Because again, if the retaining wall moves, the wood frame wall will follow it and kind of stay aligned with it vertically. Yes? Can you make the two structures? Yeah, let's do, let's do that for you. Yeah, that's pretty ugly looking, isn't it? Okay, let's talk about that. Come over here. Thank you. That's it. Force me to be good about that. Oh, and where is it? Oh, not that one. Hang on. This one. Let's say type properties, uh, structure. There's this whole issue of how they align with each other. And let me sort of align on the finished face exterior instead. Okay, and that, I think, should clean it up a little bit for us. OK, there it is. It's on the finished face exterior. My window's kind of in an ugly place, but. Oh, well, it's moving the wall. It's not what I intended to show you, but it'll work. 
So you, yeah, you can't get them to align that way. You need to decide really, are they going to align on the finish face, on the interior face, or just at, right now by default I think it's the wall center lines, which is kind of a dumb place to have them aligned by. Say again? Oh, that just has to do with, um, that's actually sort of a good question in terms of the interaction here, because that one's over there, brick on CMU. That has to do with actually the way the walls are joined at the corner. And kind of a, that's, that's an interesting one in terms of what's going on, because it's a wrapping thing. I think what's happening is it's basically picking up that the, this surface over here is wrapping around and it's kind of, it's wrapping the side of that over there. Let me try to see if I can sort of uh, change that because it's, yeah, that, 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 that looks funny in terms of what's going on over here. Let me go to the, uh, oh, the stone panel wall. Brick on stone panels. I think this is one of those cases where it's almost trying to outsmart us a little bit in terms of what's going on. So let's go to type properties. I think we have basically this issue, it's a wrapping issue. Oh, at ends, let's see if it does it or not. And it still looks like that's okay, that's overlapping that way. That's picking it up that way. <laughs> I would have thought that would actually turn that off. Let's try to turn that back to stacked wall again. Let me play around with it a little bit in terms of what's actually going on with that because yeah, it, it, it is a wrapping issue. It has to do with corners. Let me try one other thing. And this will sound really strange, but let me just sort of see if it is the answer. See, you can sort of see in its version what's happening is as those corners merge, it's trying to bring that stone panel out to there so it's kind of wrapping around the end of that wall. To control that though, let me see if I can actually do something a little smarter for you there. Um, that's just modifying the stack wall. Yeah. Let me find, before I just sort of fumble on that, let me find you a good answer for that. It has to do with how this wall join is hap you know, happening, and there's actually a tool that's specifically about editing those wall joints so we can get much more controlled about what that layer is, that layering is. Yeah? Say again? That's a good one, and I don't know of a way to do that, just automatically. You know, we can sort of set up some sort of reference lines or something like that relative to the terrain and sort of adjust it and lock it to it. But no, I don't know of a good way to do have it do that right offhand. Yeah, good question, though, because yeah, you'd like it to have that intelligence and just do that for you automatically, but I don't know how to do that right offhand. Okay, last thing on walls to talk about is customizing wall boundaries. So let's kind of show you what that looks like. Okay, the idea is, oh, let's go ahead and take a look at walls. We looked at this a little bit last time. Okay, you got this top and bottom constraint and offsets. That's pretty good if you always want your walls to be sort of horizontal at the top and bottom in certain distances. But every once in a while, it's nice to just have a wall that does something weird and just kind of cuts off at a different angle or has a hole in it or just something funny. And we can do something called ed editing the wall profile to make that happen. Now, when you can, if you can create the shape by attaching to a roof or something like that, do it that way. That's always smarter because then if the roof moves, the slope will move. This is more like we want to have some sort of interesting freeform thing happening. Another place I sometimes use this is when I'm trying to like uh, put a wall underneath a stairway or something like that where you want like a sloping wall that's kind of following the profile of something else. So let's show you what that looks like. It's actually pretty straightforward. Come back over here. Let me go through, I'm going to go out to 3D, and I'm just going to get rid of some of these walls because they're just kind of cluttering things up, and it's hard to tell what's going on. So say goodbye to all these walls. They're just not doing us much good. Kay. We'll take a new wall. I'll put it out here. I'll just do this nice wall, kind of stretch it on out. There we go. Maybe even flip its orientation so I can look at the brick on this side. Can't do it that way. Let's do it over here. Oh, it's even at a funny angle. Let me straighten that out. That'll be a little clearer. Let 
That's the danger. You'll find that as we work with the stuff, it's very alluring and tempting to be drawing in 3D all the time. The problem is, it's kind of hard to determine what's going on sometimes in 3D. So don't be surprised. If, if you're getting just really weird behavior that just doesn't seem to add up, try orbiting around a little bit. Just see if you can sort of make more sense of what it is. Often by orbiting, you'll figure out that you're not attaching to where you think you are. It just looks like you are in 3D. So uh, watch out for that a little bit. Here's the scoop. I got this wall. It's looking good. I can sort of attach its top and bottom. I can change its up and, uh, upper and lower boundaries uh, using uh, the offsets and the constraints. If I wanted to go through and do something like, oh, just have this come down at a diagonal, something like that, here's what you can do. You can choose a wall. And if you choose a wall, one of the editing choices right next to attaching the top and bottom is something called editing the profile. <coughs> editing the profile is going to look just like what we did when we were editing floors. You sort of have a continuous boundary around the outside of the wall, and you can change that boundary to either put an interior loop that'll cut away or kind of slice off things. So let's show you what that looks like. We'll say edit the bound profile. It gives us the pink line that defines the wall. So if I want to slash away part of that wall or create some sort of custom shape, I can just define some new pink boundary. Now, this has to be a continuous loop in the same sense that it was in the floor. So I can use the trim tool to trim away some of these pieces. Go ahead and try that. See if you can kind of cut away some different things. But when we say finish this sketching process, we're going to create a wall that has that profile instead. So we'll say finish the wall. And it'll look like that. So you can really create any custom shape you want to. Okay. Very, very useful. There are times when you need to sort of just uh, manually have something happening. Oh, on the side of a stairway, you just want to create some sort of architectural effect. You have something where you want things to be a little bit different. Also very useful from the standpoint, every once in a while you want to create a window and you just have no window that quite fits what you have in mind. Okay, So you can go through and draw different shapes. For example, I'm just drawing something in there. Let me offset something over there, oh, about a two feet in. I'll do it like that, a little rainbow window. And again, I need to sort of make a loop. Oops, I'm offsetting, so it's putting it in the wrong space. Let me get rid of that loop. We'll draw a line with no offset from here to here. But any sort of continuous surface that you can make, or continuous loop that you can make, we'll cut it out. Okay, so use editing wall profiles judiciously. Don't use it all the time. If you can create a window and put it in there and get the glass in and all that type of stuff, that's better for you. But if you just need to sort of have some sort of control, we can go through and create very sort of custom openings this way. Yeah, a lot of people ask, you know, what would you do if you want to put glass in there? And we'd have to actually go through and put another wall made of glass right on top of that wall, then trim its profile so it sort of fits into that hole. Okay, which sounds pretty awful, but it's really not. I could go through and create another wall, just lay it right on top, and then kind of like uh, cut up the opening. But I won't show you that right now. Okay, feeling pretty good about walls? If you like liking walls and you're feeling pretty good, how about this? Why don't you stand up and stretch? Come on back for about in about five minutes, and we will continue looking at doors, windows, and curtain walls and kind of complete the rest of this. So we'll see you in five.